Hi, my name is Alex Huth, and I'm going to tell you about a study I did here at UC Berkeley, along with Shinji Nishimoto, Ann Vu, and Jack Gallant. When you look around the world, your brain is busily recognizing and categorizing everything that you see. So we presume that different categories of things are represented differently in the brain. But that doesn't mean that they're represented in completely different ways. Take cars and motorcycles, for example. They share a lot of features. They both have wheels, they both have headlights, they both go on roads. They fulfill pretty much the same functions. So you might think that they're represented pretty similarly in the brain. But how can we extend this idea to all the thousands of categories that we can see? One way would be to use a semantic space, where nearby categories are semantically similar, but distant categories are semantically very different. So what does the brain semantic space look like? Which of the thousands of categories that we can see are represented similarly in the brain and which aren't? To answer these questions, we put five human subjects in an MRI machine and recorded their brain activity while we showed them two hours of movie trailers, where we had labeled all the objects and actions that appeared during each second of the movies. Now, functional MRI measures blood flow in little rectangular areas called voxels. Our voxels are about 2 by 2 by 4 millimeters, and it takes about 30,000 of them to cover the entire cortex. So our next step was to determine how each category of object and action affected the blood flow in each voxel. We did this using regularized regression analysis. What we're left with is a model that tells us how each of the 30,000 voxels responds to each of the 1,705 categories in the movies. Then we used principal components analysis, or PCA, to recover a semantic space from each subject's brain. PCA gives us a low dimensional space where categories that are represented similarly in the brain are close together, but categories that are represented very differently tend to be far apart. Interestingly, we found that the first four dimensions seem to be shared across our subjects. Now, of course, our true shared semantic space has more than four dimensions, but we're limited here by uh, the size of our stimulus set and the resolution of fMRI. So what do the shared semantic dimensions look like? We're going to visualize them here using a graphical structure drawn from WordNet, which is a semantic taxonomy painstakingly hand-constructed by a team of linguists. Each category is shown as a node, and the links between categories show is a relationships, like an athlete is a human. Verb categories, like communication verbs and movement verbs, are shown as separate trees. Here we're showing the first shared semantic dimension. It seems to distinguish things that move, like people, animals, and vehicles, from things that don't, like buildings in the sky. This is not really surprising, since we know that bright, fast things just tend to elicit more activity in visual cortex. The next three dimensions distinguish categories associated with people, categories associated with civilization, and biological categories. But instead of looking at each dimension separately, we can visualize all three at the same time. Now we've colored each node to show where it lies in each dimension. The red component of the color is set by the second dimension, the green component is set by the third, and the blue component is set by the fourth. So for example, the category that's high on the second and third dimensions but low on the fourth, like a mammal, will appear yellow. This makes it so categories that are represented similarly in the brain are assigned similar colors. Here we see that people and communication verbs are represented similarly, and animals are also not so different. Vehicles and buildings and movement verbs are also pretty similar to each other, but different from people and animals. This movie is showing the same data, but we've also positioned each node according to where it lies on the second, third, and fourth dimensions. So now we have a pretty good idea of what the brain's semantic space looks like. We can use the semantic space to map out how different categories are represented in different parts of the brain. The first step is to take a high-resolution anatomical MRI of each subject's brain. Then we use this image to construct a 3D model of the cortical surface. Then we flatten out the cortical surface so that we can see the entire cortex at the same time. Now we can color in each voxel according to what part of the semantic space it's selected for. These colors are the same that we saw earlier. Green is for humans, yellow is for other animals, pink and violet are for vehicles, and dark blue is for buildings. What we see is a really complex pattern of semantic selectivity throughout higher visual cortex. These patterns are consistent with the well-known semantically selective brain areas, like the fusiform face area and parahippocampal place area, but we also see semantic selectivity in much of the surrounding cortex. Now, if you find this as exciting as I do, you'll be itching to play with this data yourself. Well, you're in luck. We've made an online viewer where you can see the flattened and 3D brain maps. You can click on each voxel to see exactly which categories it represents. You can click on each category to see exactly how it's represented across the cortex.
This viewer is available now at gallantlab.org slash semanticmovies. So that's it. If you want to learn more, read the paper at Neuron, and thanks for listening.